Come on, touch a couple people. Say he's moving on your behalf right now. He's moving on your behalf right now. Isaac. Hallelujah. Hello, Revival Life fam. You know, Lillian used to be our worship leader, and then she had a, um, a baby, which was nice. We were happy because we had been harassing her for so long to have a child. And then she took off, I don't know, a, a decade or so to raise the child to the age of two. <clears throat> and then one time, Corey couldn't lead worship, and I think Kellyanne was out of town. I think I'm a little hot, Mr. Soundman. Mr. Soundman, I think I'm a little hot. A little on the hot side. And uh, Corey and Kellyanne both couldn't serve. I think Corey fell in a ravine or something. And um, Lillian, this is a funny story. So Lillian mm, led worship, and she hadn't led worship again in like a generation. And, um, and uh, someone came up to her to encourage her. They're like, have you ever led worship before? You're, you're pretty good. And, like, she's like, yeah, yeah, I've been uh, doing that for about forever. And she's pretty good. Can you give it up for her right now? She's pretty good, right? <laughs> pretty good, right? Say happy birthday to Felipe. The big 30, the big 3-0. Some of y'all are like, that's just getting started. Just getting started. Still a child. Hallelujah. You feeling good this morning? Are you feeling good this morning? Jesus in the house. Pretty happy. There's room on the front row. You want to come get within distance of the anointing? It's right here. I promise you, God is present. We are, come on. Hey, we're continuing, mm, we're continuing ah, our message series, Revelation. Uh, excuse me, our, our message series. What is our message here? Spiritual revival. Next week, a good friend of mine, Pastor Pedro, is going to be here. I'm going to be in the house. I'm going to re-receive, and I'll be right there catching everything I can. Have them lay hands on me. I bring somebody. Uh, it's going to be good. Uh, also, um, I, don't, I don't want to reiterate a, um, uh, well, actually, I do. Uh, our our um, teaching series in July on Fridays on um, moving mountains, uh, the healing heart journey. Hey, you might be like, I already hear God. I don't need to go to that. Well, if you think that, then you need to go to that because it's not even really about hearing God. It's about seeing God. So uh, it's going to be good. The first one has been, is going to be really, they're all going to be very good. I, I uh, encourage you to, as you're able to, to come on to those. Amen? Amen. Hey, we're running late, but I'm not going to go late, so we'll be good, okay? All right. All right t -t tell your neighbor, like, he's talking now, so I'm going to get involved. Tell somebody. He's talking now. Now, this is it. This is the main attraction right here. It's time. It's time. Hallelujah. Today, I want to talk to you about revelation knowledge. Yeah. I want to talk to you today about revelation knowledge. I'm going to talk about revelation knowledge today. Today, I believe God's going to do something in your life. He's going to give you the ability to receive revelation knowledge. We'll just keep going. Today, in the message, Holy Spirit is going to move. In regards to the subject of revelation knowledge. You'll receive if you're expecting. I'm just trying to help you. I'm plowing here a little bit. Plowing a little bit. All right. Title of my message today is revelation knowledge. Somebody's going to get something. Amen? That's you. Amen. Revelation knowledge is, uh, is knowledge that you receive by the Spirit. By the Spirit of God, who gives you knowledge that you could not know on your own. It's not, a, it's not word of knowledge. It is by the Spirit. It's when God drops something into you, hear me, that becomes part of you. Revelation knowledge becomes part of you. When it's truly from the Lord, it becomes part of you. Now, we can go to school and study. All, I don't know. We've all studied things in school that we forgot like as soon as the test was over, right? Like, we didn't carry that to the next week. I've learned stuff in school that I didn't want to be learning. I, I, I put it in a certain part of my brain that dumps quickly, right? And you learn it, you do the test, and then you just like, you just move on with your life. Revelation knowledge becomes a part of you. And here's something I want you to, I want you to, I want you to think about. You know, God, I want you to think about this. God never butt dials you. He never accidentally calls your name while sitting on his phone, right? Like he doesn't accidentally like, oh, didn't mean to call you. God talks to you on purpose. He talks to you on purpose to change you, to grow you, to transform you into his image. Amen? And so it's important that we're able to discern this revelation knowledge that he wants to give us. Now, we're not going to get weird if you're getting a little concerned. We're not, well, 
one man's weird is another man's normal, I guess. I guess uh, it's all in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, but we're not going to depart from the historic faith. We're not going to depart from the Bible. We're not doing anything strange today. We're going to talk about what has always been known, but some people have decided to uh, not believe. But, uh, you know, revelation knowledge is like, I had an old pastor, uh, and the way he would teach it is this way. He didn't use these words of revelation knowledge, but he called about knowing it in your knower. I know in my knower. I know in the place where I know things. Like it's now part of me. Like if the Lord spoke to you about your spouse and you got married, that is now settled, right? Like it is settled information. You know that you know that you know that this person is your wife. Just like I know that I know that I know my name is Carl and that I know I'm called to ministry. I know that Tracy is my wife. I know that God loves me. I know it in my knower and I can't unknow it. It is now part of me. Does that make sense? That is revelation knowledge to me. It's now part of who I am. I can't tell the story of Carl without telling you about what God has put on the inside of me, right? It's now part of me. I can't deny that. You know, this isn't just a, this isn't a thing that I do. It's not a religious custom that I attend. This is who I am. I am a Christian. I have been saved, and there's no doubt about it in my mind. Amen? Amen. It's part of who I am, and I know it in my knower. Amen? It's revelation knowledge for me. Does this make sense? Yes. Now, here's the problem. Jesus only interacts through revelation knowledge. Jesus interacts with people through revelation knowledge. Uh, the problem with the disciples were they weren't saved yet, and so they never knew what he was talking about. As you read the Gospels, they, Jesus would say things, and they'd be like, wait, what? Eat your what and drink your what? Wait, what? What are we, what are we talking about here? And he talked to a, a revelation knowledge uh, to everyone. Um, and, and if you study the Scriptures, you'll find the only people that Jesus answered questions from were his disciples. Lots of people asked him questions. The Pharisees asked him questions, and Sadducees asked him questions. The, the, everybody, the Herodians asked him questions. Everybody asked him questions. The crowds, his disciples, he only answered his disciples. You have access to revelation knowledge because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't have to live in mystery. You don't have to live not knowing. You don't have to live uh, so that you don't, you don't know where, what's happening or what's going on or where it's going. You don't have to live un, unsure. You don't have to live without an assurance. Jesus actually wants to share these things with you. But they never understood why Jesus spoke that way. They didn't understand the plan was to draw people into his inner circle and that he would share his heart with people who loved him. Does this make sense? And so the disciples, they, 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 they never did get it. Like, they didn't get it until uh, he rose from the dead and breathed the spirit on them. Because how could they, right? How, how could they? And so they were like, you know, you explain everything to us. Why don't you explain things to other people? Like, and they're, I could see what they're thinking. They're like, we're trying to build something here. Like, we have, you know, books to sell. And we have, you know, conferences to throw. And, you know, we have all kinds of things that need to happen here. We're trying to start a movement, maybe a revolution, maybe overthrow. Why do you keep talking to these people confusing ways, right? They says that to them in Matthew chapter 13. He says, the disciples say, hey, why do you speak to them in parables? And of course, a parable is a story that has a, has a, a moral story to it, right? It has a moral point or a religious point to a theological point. A parable is, a, and, and, and we are designed to learn through parable. We're, we're designed to learn through story, we are designed to live through story. Before the scriptures were ever written, they were passed down orally. That's just, that's just fact. That's not, it's not debatable, right? It's not, Moses didn't sit around one day and get all this by divine knowledge and just write the first five books of the Bible. It's known that it was passed down orally. And Moses wrote, now some of it was, you know, Moses. The only part in the Bible, I'll say it this way, written by God is the Ten Commandments. Because he literally wrote that on, on stone, right? Like he wrote that on stone. Everything else was written through people who had divine revelation. Does that make sense? And we, we're called to learn through story. Uh, I know many um, uh, Cuban families who on every Thanksgiving, and I've, I've heard this from so many, they sit down with their family and they read the Exodus story. And they talk about how their family had to do an exodus from Fidel Castro and the Lord delivered them to the United States and now they're free. It's just a, it's just a given. And many, many families have a story. And I would challenge you, if you have not put your family story in the story and started telling the story of your family to your children, start now. Uh, if you don't have children yet, start telling it to your spouse. If you don't have a spouse yet, start telling it to people who may or may not care. But tell the story of your family. Tell the family story. If you don't know your family story... I don't want to be morbid, but everybody's going to die. And you don't want people to die with your family story without you being able to carry it on. Amen? 
Yeah, so we want, to, we, want to, we want to capture this story that people went before us. The whole scripture is a story of what God has done with us, for us, and through us. Amen? And so this, this is how we learn. We learn through story. And Jesus taught through story. The problem is they didn't have any idea what the story meant because they didn't have the decoder ring, the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said to them in verse 11, he said, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them... It has not been granted. Now, how does that make you feel that to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom? That should be a big deal. That should be a big deal. That to you it's been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. See, what that even means is kind of a mystery, right? Like, what what are the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven? It's a mystery. But you could know it. That's good news, right? You can discern what that means. You can know it. And God will share that with you. That, that, is, that is part of our heritage as being Christians. And I'm saying all this because I want to be able to, I want to kind of provoke your hunger for revelation knowledge, really just hearing God and understanding in your circumstances. And I want to kind of impart a little bit of faith to receive revelation knowledge. Revelation knowledge happens when the living spirit of God is active in the learning environment. When the living spirit of God is active in the learning environment, and anywhere I am, he's there, Right? So he's here in the learning environment. Is he here with you? I hope he is because I, I brought him with me. So I'm learning. Uh, I hope you're learning. I hope he's active in your learning environment. I hope you invite him in. And when you live in the spirit, now this is not something super spiritual that you have to pray nine hours a day, but it's just a, it's a state of consciousness. It's a state of awareness of the presence of God. And as you live trying to walk with Holy Spirit, you live with an open door to revelation knowledge, right? I know this is very simple, but I'm hitting this so it really gets in you in a significant way. Uh, You may receive revelation knowledge lots of ways. In prayer, God may talk to you, and you have just learned something you did not know before you started praying, right? A lot of people get revelation knowledge reading the Bible. You're reading the Bible, He's talking to people, woe is unto you, you Pharisees, you blind guides, whatever. And you're thinking, I need to stop hanging out with that person. It has nothing to do with what it said in the Bible, but all of a sudden you got revelation knowledge. I've just got part of God's will in my life. This person is not healthy for me. I, need to, I thought I had to be around them, and God is now telling me, this is not healthy. You need to break this thing off. And just by me saying that, I feel like that is even a prophetic word for somebody in the room right now. And this will be revelation knowledge for you. There's someone in your life. Now, I'm not talking about your mom. I'm not talking about your spouse. This is not confirming any of those things. Don't abandon your children. But you know what an unhealthy relationship looks like, right? When I ask questions, I'm actually asking questions. You know what, you know what unhealthy relationships look like, right? At some point, you've got to try to reform those relationships. Sometimes they can be reformed. No, other times you've got to give them the, the left foot of fellowship, right? Like, it's, this is not going to work out no more. You're not living where I want to be living, right? Amen. Now, I don't want to leave any relationships, but sometimes as you're moving, relationships don't move with you. And that's, it is what it is, right? Like, I'm going to a healthy place. You could join me there. Start Sunday morning, we'll be there together, plenty of extra seats. No? I don't know what to say, because I'm not trying to do what you're doing, right? Yeah. Through the preached word, as we just saw, you can get revelation knowledge. Through, through reading scriptures, through, through reading inspirational books, sometimes you'll get revelation knowledge. God could speak to you right in your job. I hate to tell you this, but God will often talk to you through your supervisor at work. Yeah. And that's not who you want to hear God from. That's why you quit. And, and, and sometimes the toughest way of hearing God is through your children. Yeah, it's almost never encouraging, is it? It's like, why do you do that? And the Lord's like, because you do it. Oh, that hurts. Why do we have to go there? We were having such a good time together. <laughs> God will talk to you through your kids, right? Mostly through their issues, unfortunately, but hallelujah. <clears throat> so today what I want to do is I want to study a passage of Scripture in our remaining time. Uh, it should be good for time here. I want to study our passage of Scripture, and I want us to try to gain revelation knowledge as we study it. Now, we're not going to study a passage of Scripture on revelation knowledge. We're going to try to use revelation knowledge to look at the Bible. The Bible is actually living because the Spirit of God will speak to you through it. 
It's not some stale thing that there's one meaning, this is that, and that's that. No, no, no. Holy Spirit is there with you, and it's living. Right? There's safeguards where we don't get off the tracks, but, you know, we're just going to trust that we're here in the midst of the people of God, and we're going to be safe. Amen? So if you've got a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 7. Several scriptures I want to point out here, but I'm going to tell the story, which I think is a pretty good story. It says, soon after, now Jesus was doing Jesus stuff, right? Because he's dope and he does Jesus stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's who he is, right? So Jesus was doing Jesus stuff, and afterwards, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, don't cry. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. This report concerning him went, all, went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. Can you say amen to the reading of the word? Yeah. Hallelujah. Pretty good story right there, right? Yeah. Jesus, way maker. Yeah. Miracle worker. I don't know if he had a promise, but he, he's a promise keeper. It's who he is, right? And so as we look at this, as we look at this physical miracle and we think about prophetic revelation, uh, there was a, a, um, a theologian around A.D. 400, so about, about 400 years after Jesus. He was about from 360 or 380 to about 430 or 40. His name was Augustine of Hippo. Now, Hippo was not the animal. He was not an animal tamer. It was not his anointing. It's actually a city in Algeria which is northern Africa. He was northern African. His name was Augustine. We have named a city after him in Florida. Can anybody guess what it is? St. Augustine. You guys, you must have seen the first service. Joking there. So Augustine of Hippo, he has this to say about these miracle, these physical miracles. He said, the Lord's work of mercy to the body has spiritual implications to the soul. The Lord's work of mercy to the body has spiritual implications to the soul. What does that mean? Well, God is interested in you, spirit, soul, and body. Yes? He, he, he cares about all of you. So he doesn't just want to heal your leg and let you be depressed forever. He doesn't just want to heal your sight and let you go to hell. Right? He Actually, there's soul implications to every physical miracle that he does. Now, this is not the Bible, but this is how somebody reads the Bible, and I believe it's correct. Uh, uh, and so, so Augustine and Hippo was saying, you know, listen, uh, uh, these accounts uh, 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 that we see in the Bible physically, we should think about what that means for us spiritually. Now, before we do that, we, we, we're going to talk about there's three people that Jesus raised from the dead in the New Testament that it's recorded in the New Testament. There were way more than three people raised from the dead by Jesus. We know that there were many people that he raised from the dead, and there were accounts, they said, tell John the Baptist that the, that the dead are being raised. Like, it was common, but we only have three that we have recorded. Now, um, one of them uh, that we have recorded um, is um, uh, the daughter of Jairus. Now, you remember the daughter of Jairus? Jairus was a leader in the temple, excuse me, in the synagogue, and his daughter was 12 years old, and uh, Jesus was on the way to raise her from the dead, and he touched, a woman touched him who had been bleeding for 12 years. He was going to raise a 12-year-old, someone who had been bleeding for 12 years touched him, she was healed, and then the daughter of Jairus, who was dead but had not been taken out of the house yet, was raised from the dead. You might think there's something up with the two 12s there. There are, but that's not this message. So we see the 12-year-old uh, daughter of Jairus who was raised from the dead. We saw Lazarus was raised by the dead. And Lazarus was, by many accounts, Jesus' best friend on the earth. Uh, Lazarus, we know, um, was a follower of Christ, right? We don't know if the daughter of Jairus was a follower, but we knew that uh, Jairus had enough faith to call Jesus. But, but Lazarus was a follower of Christ, and he was dead, he was carried out, and he was buried and he was raised from the dead, right? And then we see uh, the son of the widow in this story who was dead and carried out but not yet buried. 
and he was raised from the dead, right? So, so we see these three accounts in these three states of death, so to speak, being brought back from the dead. And if we take Augustine of Hippo or St. Augustine's words about the Lord's work of mercy to the body has spiritual implications to the soul, we could say that when Jesus healed those who were physically cast out of the community, he now heals people who are mentally and socially cast out of the community to bring them back in. And Jesus, Jesus healed people who were physically blind, and today he not only heals the physically blind, but the spiritually blind as well. Amen? And, and, and then he, he healed people who are physically dead, but today he heals people who are physically dead and spiritually dead. He brings them back to life as well. And in those, he, 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 he healed people who are physically paralyzed. And we can come to the conclusion that he heals people who are paralyzed in indecision and fear and, 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 and unbelief and paralyzed and unable to move forward in life. What we see Jesus do physically in the Bible, we know that he does both physically, spiritually, and in the soul today. Does that make sense? It's, he's a good God. Can you say amen? Come on, give a clap off for Jesus. It's, it's, it's good. And, and as, as, as we read the scriptures, we see that Jesus, he, he, he not only healed because he's good. And that would be enough reason, right? Just he's good, right? And, 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 and we know that Jesus healed because he, he, he loves us, right? But he also healed for a very divine purpose of demonstrating his divine power over disease, sickness, and sin. He demonstrated his, his authority over disease, sickness, and and sin. Amen? So Jesus had, he had established, well, that's a good word, yeah, that's, he had established this. So let's take a look at Jesus in this story, right? Jesus is on the move, right? Jesus is always on the move. Verse 11, let's take a look. It says, soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Wait there one second. So now we see a little bit more in the story. He's walking along, his disciples are with him, but there's also a large crowd following him toward the city of Nain. Next verse, please. Verse 12. Uh, now, as he appeared, as he approached the gate of the city. Now, these little location markers are significant in the scriptures for understanding both what's happening and what the Lord wants to talk to you about. Now, the gate of the city was not just like, you know, you want to go in your backyard, you go through the gate, right? It's not just a gate. Uh, the gate of the city is, is a, it's a, it's a physical place both there is an opening in the wall, but there's also a large municipal complex built there. It's where government work was done. It's where business was done. It's where transactions and things were sold. Uh, we know that when uh, Abraham was buying a grave for his wife, Sarah, he went to the gate of the city to purchase a catacomb uh, to bury her in. Uh, we know that justice and laws were done there. We know that contracts uh, were done there because they didn't have written contracts. They only had oral contracts. So you needed to go where there were witnesses. And there were witnesses always at the gate of the city. So you go there where there was a crowd doing business. So we saw one crowd coming into the city. Now there's another crowd at the gate of the city. It says a dead man was being carried out. Now, there was at this gate of the cities where justice was also done. Now, if you were ever in youth ministry, uh, you were very familiar with the passage of Scripture in the Old Covenant in Leviticus that says that if your children are rebellious, the word says to drag them out to the gate of the city and stone them to death, right? Every, ch every youth minister has used that Scripture at some point as a really bad joke. But that's what the Scripture says. You take them out of the gate of the city and you stone them to death. This is where justice would happen at the gate of the city. So now as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. Now we have three crowds. We have a crowd following Jesus. We have a crowd following the death march. We have a crowd at the gate. And this is where these three crowds converge, at the gate of the city. And so, verse 13, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said, do not weep. Now, when I go to a funeral, you would think most of the attention would be on the dead person. But Jesus didn't speak once about the condition of the dead person. It doesn't tell us that Jesus even said anything about him. He's talking about the mom. Why would Jesus be talking 
about the mom. All throughout Scripture, we see Jesus having compassion on widows, on the outcast, on the foreigner. Jesus is with the marginalized. He is with the downtrodden. He is with the poor. Don't feel like you have to become somebody for God to look at you. Jesus is, has compassion on your plight. You don't have to wonder if he does. He does. And he has, amen. And he has compassion on this woman. And we know, like, we can see that he wants to give this dead man a second chance at life. But we don't think about the widow, and that's all we talk about. Now, she's a widow, and as a widow, she only had her son to provide for her. We have to think about the society that they lived in, and they weren't exactly equals in this society, right? And so Jesus not only is going to give this son a second chance at life, he's giving his mom a second chance at life. Having lost her only son, she lost her, her ability to have a voice in the community, she would have had no more representation or means in society because her son was the one who was able to provide that for her. So we see Jesus working. And, and I want you to know this. You may want God to work directly. You may be praying for all kinds of things. And I need God in my situation. And you don't see God moving in your situation at all. God doesn't need to give you financial blessing to get into that house. God just needs you to be able to afford it. He can give you more money or make the house cost less. Does this make sense? I've seen this too many times to get tripped up on, I can't afford it. All I need is it. And God, I need you to make a way. And so you may never get the money. You may find out that somebody paid for it for you. You may find out that, God, you're praying for your family member to be saved, and you're wondering why they're not coming to church. And you're, you just keep ministering to people, and God will raise up somebody in their circle of influence that they respect to minister to them. I've seen it too many times. Like, I preached them for five years, and then their best friend gets saved, and all of a sudden they get saved. I'm like, no, no, that's good. <laughs> that's, it's, that's good. That's important. It's, that's, that's what we want to have happen. We don't care how it happens as long as they get saved, right? You just keep sowing seed, the Lord will bring the harvest however he wants, right? And this is what happens. Like, this young man needs to be raised from the dead, and Jesus ain't even thinking about him. He's not thinking about him at all. And he says, he, you know, he may not work on your behalf directly, right? Like, but you have to trust that he's working in your network. Verse 14, he came up and he touched the coffin and, and said to the bearers, and, excuse me, he came up, touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. Now, it is sin for a Jew to touch a dead body. And so they wrapped them. They didn't put them in coffins. They wrapped them. You know, Jesus was wrapped. Lazarus was wrapped. That's how they did it. And so Jesus touched this body. And again, it's sin to touch a dead body. But how many know when he touched it, it wasn't dead anymore? <laughs> so does that make sense? You can't touch that dead body. It's sin. Not sin. Right? Like it's everything he touches comes alive. Right? Amen. Don't hide Jesus in your problems. Don't hide him from work. Don't hide him from your friends. Everything Jesus touches comes alive. Right? It says, he came up and he touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt, which I would expect because, again, I, I need you to see this. We're at the gate of the city and people who sin, this is where they take them to punish them. The bearers stop the coffin. They think somebody just sinned. It's a place of judgment. Why don't you see this, right? Revelation knowledge. Let's take a look here. And so Jesus says, young man, I say to you, arise. Now, Here's what I want you to get out of this miracle before we move on. Augustine said it this way. I want to quote him again if you don't mind. He who raised himself from the dead can raise all of the death, all from the death of sin. Therefore, this is the part for you, let no one despair. Let no one despair. Come on. Let no one. Let, let, me, let me put that in New Carl translation, right? Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible. Come on. No, no, no. Come on. Nothing is impossible. He raised himself from the dead. How does that happen? I don't know, right? But anything less than that, he's got authority over. So at this place where justice is done, normally when Jesus shows up, where justice was done, mercy triumphs over judgment. Do you see this? 
At the gate of the city, Jesus now showing, listen, this judgment's no longer going to reign. Mercy will triumph over judgment at this place of judgment. Does that make sense? This is a good word right here, and I'm feeling encouraged myself. So the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him, watch this, back to his mother. Jesus heals families. Jesus is into family. Jesus believes in family. If you are the only saved one in your family, you need to just believe that you are the first fruits and that the rest will be holy. Amen? If you've got a child who's a little away from God, I just like to laugh sometimes and think they can't run forever. The word, the, 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 the prayers that you've sown, the offerings that you've sown, it's impossible for it to come back void. It's impossible to come back void. I've seen too many people pass, or excuse me, get saved in their 80s and 90s who fought God their whole life. And we like them to get saved when they're, you know, five, but I'll take better late than never. Amen? Are you with me? We get discouraged because it doesn't happen when we want it to happen. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus restored him to his mother. And in that, restored her to her place. This is a good word. Now, again, Lazarus, we know, was a believer, so we know there was faith there. Like, was it active faith? I don't know. He was dead. I don't know, but there was faith there, right? His family were friends with Jesus, and he was raised from the dead, right? And we know the daughter of Jairus, he, dad had had enough faith to call Jesus, right? And so Jesus raised her from the dead. Um, so we could say maybe his faith is what was active, but we don't see anything about faith here in this story. We don't, we don't know that the young man ever had faith. We don't hear about him again. We don't know about the mom. We don't hear about her again. All we know is that Jesus is good. And then when Jesus encounters death, there's life. So you do not have to drum up anything. You don't have to work up anything. You just need to love Jesus. Jesus heals at every phase of death. Dead, but still in the house. Dead and taken out of the house. Dead, taken out of the house and buried. There's nothing impossible for God. You're like, well, it's too late now. It's impossible for it to be too late for Jesus. It is impossible for it to be too late for Jesus because he brings the dead to life. And I'm telling you this for two reasons. Number one, I want you to expect to get revelation knowledge as you're interacting with God. But number two, I want you to expect in your life that he's going to do the same for you that he did for this young man and that he did for this widow woman. I want you to believe that God is going to begin moving on your behalf in areas you don't even see him moving. Maybe you're carrying the body out. Maybe the whole crowd behind you is lamenting. Maybe they're doing the dirge already and the, and the grave has been purchased and all you have to do is bury the body. I'm here to let you know Jesus is going to meet you at the gate. I just felt like the Lord told me as I read this scripture. He said to me, he said to me, he said, well, he didn't say Carl. He always calls me son. He said, son, he said, son, I'm meeting you at the gate, and you will rise again. That's what he said to me personally, and I believe he told me to tell you. He is meeting you at the gate today. He's meeting you at the gate today, and you will rise again, and you will speak of the wonders of God. Stand with me if you would as I read this last verse. Luke 7, 16. Fear gripped them all, as I would expect, amen? That would freak you out a little bit. Come on, let's just be honest. Ha, I feel the anointing. Woo, Shabbat. Now fear gripped them all, the Bible says. And they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. You think? You think? Listen, I don't know where you think God is absent. I don't know where the death march is in your life right now. But the Lord told me to tell you, he's going to meet you at the gate of the city. And in that place of emptiness, you will be giving glory to God. You will be glorifying God. And you will be able to tell God, people, God 
has visited me in this place. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? Can you say amen? Hallelujah. 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 Shakaba. Now listen, in a minute, I'm going to be out in the lobby. I'd like to say hi to anybody who wants to say hi or not. I'm going to say hi to you anyways. But before I do that, I would like to just lay hands on some people. Either, number one, wow, you feel like you, you want, mm, Mike, it's moving now. Wow. Shaba. Huh. Woo. Give me one second here. Mm. The anointing just kind of rolled in here. Just start receiving. Ha. Huh. Ha. Huh. I want to lay hands on people. Maybe you are at the gate of the city and you are about to bury that thing. I want to touch you and believe God for life. But maybe you're desperate for revelation knowledge and that the mysteries be revealed. I want to touch you and declare life. Let me pray for you before you go. Father, in the name of Jesus, wow. I declare over your people life, blessing, prosperity, but most of all, fellowship with you. That close, secret time with you where they can say, I know that I know that I know that Jesus is alive and he has saved me and he is my God. Father, I declare over your people this week. Ha. Huh. Ha. Huh. Times of encounter in the secret place. And I declare blessing over their housing, blessing over their families, blessing over their witness this week in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen, amen, amen. If you want me to pray for you, I want you to come up very quickly right now. Corey, come on. Come on, can we thank the Lord for the word this morning? Hallelujah. Hey, I want to encourage you before you leave. The gift of God that's in you, the world needs it. You are the encounter with Jesus that the world needs. You are the encounter with Jesus that the world needs. The hope of God lives in you. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. And as you go out in the world this week, as you go to your workplace, as you go to school, as you're around your family, be that. Be light, be salt, be hope, be encouragement. Amen. Amen. Say hello to somebody you didn't come with. God bless you guys. I love you. Can we give it up for one, one more time for what God's doing in our midst? Have an amazing Sunday. We'll see you next week. If you want to hang out and receive for a little bit, we're going to continue to worship and pray for each other. God bless you guys. Have an amazing day. We'll see you later.